Desideratum is a Latin word. It means things that are desired as essential. The Desideratum podcast celebrates stories, the art of telling, and the journey of listening. With narrator Teresa Bakken and her author, artist, and wordsmith friends. Episode 25. Author Marjorie Herrera Lewis is a career sports writer who's covered Texas football at all levels. In fact, she was the first female sports writer to cover the Dallas Cowboys. I talked to her on a sunny day about the happy coincidences at this point in her life that led her to write a novel called When the Men Were Gone. At its heart, it's about another female sports enthusiast, Tyleen Wilson, whose story had been lost to the dustbins of history. Marjorie shares why Tyleen's World War II era story is still very relevant today. We begin with how she found Tyleen's voice in the darkness. I decided to write in the middle of the night because I wanted to take myself back to 1944. And I couldn't do it during the day because there are so many different distractions. So, you know, around midnight, I would sit at my computer at the kitchen table and uh, keep only the kitchen light on and embrace the darkness of the night and, mm. and just be alone with my story. I would put on a brown wood letter jacket. Then I would put a picture of the real Tylene and her husband, John, next to my computer, a mug of coffee, and sometimes I'd even put in 1940s music on my cell phone and I would play big band music or the Andrew sisters and some, and I would take my, myself back to 1944 and in first person. So I would start writing, what would Tylene tell us? What would she want us to know? And that's mm. how I wrote the book in the middle of the night, becoming a 1940s person. And I just, I just fell in love with it. I love that image. I really do. I think writers have so many different tricks that sort of help them live with the character. And you were really, you were channeling a real person. Yes. And as I read the book, I really, I was struck by how it felt like a diary. You know, there were, there were sections that would say Sunday morning, you know, it would be as if she had sat down and said, oh, you know, here's where I am. Here's what's going on. Was that purposeful for you or did that just come to you as you sort of worked your way through her story? Other than uh, the research that I did beforehand, uh, yeah. the, my um, desire to make sure that everything I wrote was authentic and that I, and that I could sound like the real Tylene. It was so important to me to sound like her. I wanted to use words she would have used. I wanted to um, have her personality uh, I didn't want to make her somebody that she wasn't. So all yeah. of that was purposeful. But once I started telling the story, it just kind of flowed from, from my head to the keyboard. <laughs> and um, yeah. it, was, it was a great experience. Well, so tell me how you found her. When did you first hear about Tylene? Why did she become a person that you wanted so dearly and deeply to tell the story? Well, I've always, I've, I've been a career sports writer. So, um, you know, for many years that I don't even want to count, <laughs> um, I was covering professional football, college football, high school football, going back throughout my entire career. So I already had uh, a real appreciation for the game. And I was always around football players and football coaches. So uh, one day, uh, 2011, the summer of 2011, my whole life is according to what sport event happened. So the Mavericks <laughs> had just won <laughs> the, the championship. So I know it was 2011. And I had really bad allergies that summer that I'd been fighting for many years that I just mm. ignored uh, really doing something about it. And that's that summer, they were so severe that I went in to get allergy tested. Mm. And um, 
the nurse that was doing the allergy testing looked at me and saw I was wearing a t-shirt that said the University of Tulsa football, my older daughter's alma mater. And she said, I love football too. Of course, all the women in my family love football because my great aunt was a football coach. And I was just like, what? Now, keep in mind that this nurse and I had crossed paths for something like 26 years. Oh, without my. A, yeah, because I was going to this allergy doctor for so long. And I asked her, I said, where was this? And she said, Brownwood, Texas. And I'm thinking Brownwood, you know, any, anybody that follows high school football in Texas knows that that Brownwood has won seven state championships with a coach by the name of Gordon Wood and their football stadiums named after him and everything. And so I'm thinking, oh my gosh, wow. And then I asked her when, and she said during World War II. And so by the time I left that appointment, I had asked her dozens and dozens of questions. And, and, and then the last one was, can I write a biography about your aunt? And she said, yes, that'd be great. So originally I set out to write a biography, but I ended up writing a novel instead. Yeah. How amazing that you knew, you knew in those few short minutes of chatting with her that this was a story that you were meant to tell. And it was also, I feel uh, like it was a good thing that I didn't find out about it 26 years earlier, because I had a lot, a lot of life experiences over that period of time that helped me to really understand her character more. And, mm. and so if I had tried to do it uh, 26 years ago, I'm not sure I would have been able to capture the authenticity yes. as, as, as closely. So, um, so I, I'm not mad. <laughs> I'm just disappointed I didn't get to meet Tylene because if I found out 26 years earlier, she was still yeah. living and, and I would have gotten to meet her. That would have been a thrill. So, yeah. So you were able to interact with her family mm -hmm. and it's, it's kind of hard for me to believe that it wasn't a better known story. So during her lifetime, like when we come to the end of the book, we're really, it's really just this window of time of her becoming the coach and, um, but, um, did she gain respect, acknowledgement, notoriety in any way during her lifetime for that achievement, for that first? No, no, that achievement went into the dustbins of history. And so when I was meeting with some of the, like the superintendents or assistant superintendents and everything, and, and I see a file of her credentials and it's got a credential to coach the boys and, and you know, all these things, they told me this should have been uh, discovered years and years uh, ago, this, that yeah. this was long overdue. Mm. And so I'm just grateful that I was able to discover it and bring it to the public. And the reason I wrote a novel instead of a uh, uh, biography is so much of the story had been lost to time. So the only mm. way that I could really memorialize what she had done um, and uh, give credit to her legacy was to create a story around things that I already knew to be true. Yes, you do a beautiful job of creating these very dimensional characters. Um, did you completely fictionalize Moose and his experiences, or is he kind of a combination of people? No, I didn't even plan to have Moose, and so I'm just writing. All of a sudden, I typed out Moose. I don't know where that name came from, anything. <laughs> it just came from somewhere into my fingers and onto the keyboard. And, um, and so I just created Moose. He's very believable. So he's a, he's a war hero. He yes. has returned injured. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the effects of that permeate everything about his life. I wanted the story to be a bigger story than just the journey of the woman who coached yes. the team, which I think is incredible all on its own, but yes. because I, it was during the war, I wanted to bring aspects of the war into the story. So, so the story is also a home front story. It's a story of the sacrifices that, that the country was making, the things that the suffering that people were going through and all. And, and so I wanted Moose to sort of embody that. And um, we could see how everything he experienced during the war change the trajectory of his life. And that in, is sort of what we see a lot in, in soldiers who go off and serve and they come back and it's changed their life to a certain extent. 
And actually, the uh, story starts in 1942. Uh, when in real life, Tylene started coaching 42. She coached from 42 through 46. But I set the book in 44 because more was happening on the home front by that time. And yes. so I wanted to go into greater depth with uh, how people at home had suffered, people had, had gone to war, what was happening. Yes, I think the other theme to me is how her motives were a bigger picture. Oh, a much bigger picture. I have little hints without giving away. Yes. Uh, I have hints throughout the book that show us, if you're looking at it very closely, you're going you're gonna to capture what was one of the reasons that was a deeply personal reason. Yeah. And um, I didn't want it to be too uh, obvious, mm -hmm. but we hear a little discussion here, a little thought here, a little movement here. So she had, she had a lot of reasons for doing this. So for the one that I'm trying to avoid revealing is one. Yes. That's a the personal second, one. Of course, yes, very personal. More, she has another one that's more altruistic. Yes, yes. Another one that's the, the book really goes into great depth about because she wants the boys to finish their childhood before they do what men do. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, because football was a father-daughter thing. And that's something she shared with her father that gave her such great joy and really enriched her life and their relationship. It also uh, had an effect on the relationship she had with her husband, John, too. So it's about relationships, too. Football it was not just about the game. As much as she loved the game, it was about relationships. And that's what football is to a large extent today, too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's the teamwork and it's the, the family. So, you know, they're in the broader sense. The book is about a lot of different things, not just her journey. That sets us up a little bit for the scene that we chose to feature happens um, in the first half of the book. And um, to me, it gets, it gets really to the heart of the connection to football and the mm -hmm. relationship with her father that you were just talking about. It has to do with a childhood condition that she had and her being yes. an outside girl. Yeah. And I... I love the way you unspooled this. And I think for me, it doesn't give away the other sort of personal reason that we discover through the whole story. But I like the way you learn about how this father-daughter connection to football and playing out in the sunshine is rooted in her childhood. Yeah, you know, I, I, I could connect with that as well. There are so many things about my life that I connected with Tylene because I had a really great relationship with my father as well and my mother. They're both sports fanatics and I grew up loving that. And so I had a lot of fun writing that piece. Okay, so we are going to pause in our conversation with Marjorie right there and listen to this scene describing some of the Brownwood community's reaction to Administrator Tylene being named Coach Tylene. It starts at a Sunday service and then flashes back to Tylene's childhood. This is from When the Men Were Gone by Marjorie Herrera Lewis, narrated by the talented, award-winning Eva Kaminsky. Sunday. John and I had read the morning paper before we made our way along Main Street to attend church services at the downtown First Baptist. The roadside newsy who shouted, Lady to coach the lions, read all about it, was nearly out of papers. Must feel like Christmas at the bulletin, John said. Appears they're making a small fortune on newspaper sales today. I laughed, but it defied my mood. Mr. Redwine and I had yet to make the official announcement, so I was certain our two automobiles had been spotted parked at the school Saturday morning, and gossip spread to a mole who had taken the story to the newspaper. I considered Moonshiner, but Mac Winslow made more sense. I knew that during Mac's rodeo stint, he had developed a friendship with a local reporter. Mac was always looking for trouble, 
And I figured this story, if not handled properly, was certain to create plenty of it. We made our way to our seats in the large 400-seat red brick church. I felt the eyes of everyone on me. Yet when I'd turned to make eye contact, everyone turned away. I had convinced myself that if the congregation had turned against me, certainly all 15,000 people in town must have as well. But what I found most awkward in that moment was sitting next to Vernon Mavis, whom we'd sat beside in church for at least the past 15 years. To sit elsewhere would spark the worst kind of gossip. After all, if our best friends had turned on us, why would anyone else care about loyalty? Still, I was not angry with Mavis, and I figured John and Vern would patch things up before sunset. We sat next to them as we always had, but I came to find out I was wrong. Vern was unrelenting. Once the preacher began, I relaxed. The theme for the day was Samuel 117. Life is too short to allow fear to stop you from your destiny, the preacher said. Destiny. I was about five years old, playing in the backyard of our old Zephyr home, when I first heard the word. It was spoken by my father. Embrace your destiny, Tylene. Those words might have been forgotten long ago had it not been a typical day changed on its head when I saw my mother crying. My father and I were standing just beyond the back porch, on a stretch of grass near the clothesline. He had positioned me about three feet from him, so he could toss a football to me. He had me rest my elbows on my sides, with my arms extended forward, and my palms facing the sky. My father would then flip the football, its tips pointing outward, into my arms. Each time, I'd clutch it as tightly as I had a tiny stray mutt, black with a trace of Scottish terrier. I'd found a month earlier on our property and asked mom if we could keep him. That evening had been unusually pleasant for a Texas summer, perhaps in the mid 80s. At one point, I asked my father if I could play football as we had a few days earlier and not just toss the football. He reminded me of my end zone destination and then he tossed the ball into my waiting arms and watched as I dash away from him, headed for a touchdown. I could hear my new little dog scampering behind me, and I was certain that if I slowed down, Frisky would tackle me, just not as my dad had days earlier when he'd grab me and circle the air with me in his arms. She's to the 20, 15, 10, five, touchdown. His voice became louder as I'd close in on the end zone marked by the clothesline, which we also used as our crossbar although I didn't start kicking field goals until I was about 10. It seemed a typical evening until my mother came to call us to supper. I looked up at the sound of her voice and saw that she had been crying. She turned quickly and returned to the kitchen. I can still hear the sound of the screen door slamming behind her. She had never before let it slam. She'd scold me when I would do that. I ran to my father. Why is mom crying, I asked. I'd never seen my mother cry. I was scared. What's wrong, daddy? Why is mom sad? My dad smiled and he answered me so quickly, I had no time to wonder why he'd smile while knowing mom was crying. Ever hear of happy tears, he asked me. Happy tears? Yes, Petunia. Sometimes when people are so happy, they cry. I was confused. Happy tears? What happened that brought on her so-called happy tears? My father handed me the football, and together we walked up to the porch, frisky trailing us. Wait here, he said to me. He walked into the house and returned to the porch in a matter of seconds. Sit down, Petunia, he said. He pulled up a chair and scooted it up close so the two of us were face to face. You're a big girl now, Tylene. So your mom and I agree it's time to explain her happy tears. I listened intently. Your mother and I were afraid you might never walk, and especially never run, he said. I was horrified, and apparently he could see it in my eyes. Probably not the best way to begin, he said. Let me start over. My father went on to tell me that he and mom first began to notice a deformation in my legs while I was still an infant. 
It had become most pronounced in my early toddler years. They were so scared, they took me to Fort Worth to see a specialist. A pediatrician, my father said. He gave us the diagnosis, something called rickets. It affects the bones, makes them soft, if they're not taken care of. But there was a cure. Sunshine, the same light that gave life to our favorite flowers, our petunias. Bessie Lee was born with strong bones, he said of my sister, who was 17 years old at the time and in the house helping mom with supper. She wasn't premature, born early like you were, so she's fine inside. But you, Petunia, you're our outside girl. Outside girl. I had a role and a reason for it. So over the years, I grew more determined to be as good an outside girl as Bessie Lee had been an inside girl. Bessie Lee could cook, sew, knit, crochet, and keep a house fit for royalty. Although I eventually learned the basics of all five of those things, my burning desire at an early age was to become proficient, a specialist, in everything outside, especially football and baseball, my two favorites, and the lures my father had used to keep me in the sunshine. In my mind, I replayed with heightened emotion the words of the preacher. Life is too short to allow fear to stop you from your destiny. Those words gave me great strength. Unfortunately, soon thereafter, John and I were reminded that not everyone in town had heard what the preacher had to say. Or, if some perhaps did, they didn't care. While the gas attendant filled up our car a block from the church, I heard a male voice from a passing car shout, Hey, lady, stay the hell away from football. I never looked up. That night, I let the comment get to me, and I finally had to admit to myself that I was scared. But I knew I couldn't let it show. I didn't share my insecurities with John, because I didn't want to bring fear into our household conversation. Plus, with the way things had turned with Mavis and Vern, I knew he was preparing for the loss of Vern's business. So I lay awake in bed for hours, second-guessing myself. Jimmy had agreed to meet me at the field house in the morning. But how was Jimmy feeling about a lady coach? Had I put the boys in a situation even worse than not playing? Would they respect me or mock me behind my back? I'd built a career as an educator, would this undermine everything I had worked for? Would I still be an effective administrator if I was a failure on the sideline? My mind wouldn't stop. I tried to block it out. I even tried to replace my thoughts with one of my favorite Andrews sister songs, by Mia Bistachun. But I never made it to the chorus. I was consumed. And so I had a lot of fun writing that piece about uh, how they would go off to these games and, and he took it upon himself to get her in the sunshine and to create this wonderful connection between the two of them. And yes. uh, I, had, I had a lot of fun writing that. I have to be honest, there were some times when I was writing in the middle of the night and I was just writing and I was crying while yeah. I was writing it. You, in your life, have been a person who you personally have had to push back against an establishment that said, oh, women don't do that. You right. Know? Well, you know, I became a sports writer. And uh, when I was hired by the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, you know, that was a huge moment for me in my life, getting to a paper of that size as a sports writer. And when I was hired in in 84, they told me then that I was the first woman that they had ever hired specifically to be a sports writer. The first day that I was there, my sports editor, he asked me a question. He said, if you're ever on the Dallas Cowboys beat, how would you cover the team? And I had never covered pro football at that point. So I told him, well, I would just cover the team the same way I would college athletes Anything. and high school athletes. Yeah, exactly. You know, mm -hmm. just always keep in mind that they're human beings and and you want to be honest and fair. And he looked at me and he said, you will never make it in this business. And, you know, I was just like, what? What did I say that was wrong? So I asked him and he said, well, you know, if you're ever covering the Cowboys beat, they don't care 
how you treat them. They just want you gone, you know, ask your questions and go away. But two years later, a different sports editor took over and he did put me on the Dallas Cowboys beat. And so I covered the team the way that I said I would. They, they respected that. So I did have to do some things that were firsts and that were difficult and that breaking new ground, you know, for a female in that area. You know, the Dallas Cowboys at that point had never had a female beat writer before from any news entity. So I was this anomaly. And, and I think that helped me understand Tylene. What I could see about at times getting pushback from somebody or, and at other times gaining acceptance based on my work. Um, and that's a lot of what Tylene experienced, you know, some pushback because of the unknown, the fear of the unknown. And then of course, once people knew that she was fully capable, um, things changed. And, and I saw that in my life. So um, it's another reason why I had to have life experiences before I could tell her story. Yes, exactly. Timing. When people say, how did you get this story? It's pure serendipity, you know? Yes. And I think there's so many instances in our life where we can look and go, oh, if I, if I hadn't met that person, or had that conversation, I wouldn't have had this conversation that led to that job that led to Yes. Yeah, I, I go back on, on those things because I'm thinking I wouldn't have met her if I, ha- if I didn't have allergies. So I'm like, hmm. <laughs> I, was, I was a junior in college when I first started having allergies. I still remember being at the doctor's office on campus and he told me you had allergies and I was so bummed. But, but now I go back and I'm thinking, wow, that was the day that I got put on the path to Tylee's story. So, you know, it's all, it's all good. <laughs> yes. You don't even realize sometimes that something has been a gift until you get further down the road and go, oh, people that cross paths with you, you think, what if that person had never crossed my path? Like that made right. that person made such a difference. You know, I have yes. two teachers that I looked up after the book came out because I wanted to thank them for what they had done for me. And one was my first grade teacher and one was my senior and high school teacher. And you don't know in those moments what will grow from them. And I want to reach out and tell them, thank you. Mm, That's such good advice, actually, rather than just internally thinking about it, to take an action and connect back to that person to validate their. Yeah. And it feels so good because, you know, my first grade teacher remembered me. And then the, the senior and high school teacher she didn't even remember me, but I just filled her in on all the things she had done for me. And we had a great conversation. It was wonderful. Yeah, I love that. So, you know, making them a part of what we study as women's history, these key figures who took risks, who pushed back. She had a lot of pushback, actually, you know, she did. Not, it, it was a little scary. Some of the, some of the scenes that you wrote felt threatening, you know, felt like she was, took a personal risk to be, to put herself out there. Yeah. Yeah. It it just, ah, also that she's, that she's cooking dinner every night. There's lots of scenes in the book where she is responsible for all the meal prep and the getting the food on the table. And I thought that was a a nice touch of realism for women of her time. I did want to show that. Yes. That she was also a product of her time. And there were certain, you know, gender expectations, but then she stepped outside of those expectations. And when you think of a football field in a small town, that's the largest gathering place for the whole city. And she was the representative, you know, she was more the face of the city than the mayor, because on Friday nights, their whole town's there. And so is the opposing team's, you know, town. And there she is facing the sidelines. So so she was very much uh, a product of her, era, but then way, way uh, far ahead, as was her husband and her father, because they saw her in a role that was outside of the expectations of a woman in the 40s. Yes. Pushing those boundaries. Yes. Yes. Things had not changed all that much in terms of women uh, on the football field, you know, a lot of other things, but, but women on a football field. And yes, uh, I guess, you know, that had actually, that part of it hadn't occurred to me. Are there women coaching high school football across Texas today? Oh, no, no, no. It's extremely rare. You'll see a woman every now and then, you know, one out of a thousand, maybe one out of 500,000. I don't know. It's very, very rare. 
And in yeah. fact, I was inspired by Tylene and I became a, a, a football coach at a small university in Fort Worth for one season. And, and when I was interviewed for that, I was told by the reporter that I was the only woman in the country at any level of football to be coaching that year. So um, in college football. So it is extremely rare. But I think it, we're, we're sort of on the brink of it changing because people are realizing that you didn't have to play it to coach it as long as you're a student of the game. You have really found a, a beautiful example of a pioneer of someone who was brave and also very, very ordinary. Like I think that's the other yes, thing. Yes, that's about, what I love about it. Yes, yeah. yes. That greatness doesn't have a reserve spot. There's no reserve space. Everybody is capable. And yes. I think that that's what she demonstrated. And that's why I want everybody to know. I want everybody to know about Tylene. I really do. <laughs> I can feel it mm. talking to you. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> and I think one of the things that makes it great, it feels like you unearthed something, you know, that you brought something to light that that was something you felt called to do. So I, I thank you oh. for it. And I thank you for the story. I think it's beautifully written. Oh, well, thank you. You can find Tylene's story in When the Men Were Gone and more about Marjorie on her website. I'll put a link in the show notes. And I'll put a picture of the real life Tylene Wilson posing with her Brownwood, Texas football team on the Desideratum website. Thank you to author Johnny Bernard for connecting me with Marjorie. And thank you for listening.